The Nigerian Civil War, or the Biafra War, was a horrific battle of ideologies which led to the death of 3 million people and a further divided nation. My name is Michael Uzomaka Jonathan and I will be tackling the history of Nigeria. Why this war took place, what happened during the war and what we feel can help lead Nigeria to become a strong and prosperous country. Nigeria is an amalgamation of different tribes and lands brought together by the British first Baron Frederick Lugard. The name Nigeria came from the Niger River and as most of the mainland in West Africa like Iboland, Yoruba land and Hausa land were situated between the Niger River. Flora Shaw, the wife of Frederick Lugard, was the person behind Nigeria's chosen name. Nigeria is a country rich with resources like tin, rubber, cocoa and ground nuts, which gave the country a huge advantage in the world's economic trade. Tired of British colonial rule, Herbert Macaulay, a Nigerian nationalist, and women like Funmilaya Ransom Kuti were one of the people who led the stage for an independent Nigeria. However, after gaining independence on October 1st, 1960, the West African country was set to adopt the British ruling and political system by setting a Prime Minister as the main democratic leader and allowing parties which can assume country leadership through electoral vote. However, this was the beginning of the civil unrest. As said, the main tribes in Nigeria were the Hausa, Igbo and Yoruba, each with different ways of life that created conflict within the country. The Hausa who lived in the northern region of Nigeria were mainly a Muslim majority and they were farmers educated in Quranic schools. They had a very conservative culture. The Igbos, which are a Christian majority, lived in the southeast of Nigeria. They were usually well educated and giants in commerce and business. Their mindset is similar to the American dream in their love for entrepreneurship and the hard-working nature. Their culture was said that only those who could contribute something of value to society to be the ones with upper social status. The Yorubas lived in the western part of Nigeria and were well educated and focused more into the arts. That is why we had musicians like Fela Kuti, the founder of Afrobeat, who was a proud Yoruba man, and Wole Shoyinka. The Igbos and Yorubas usually got along, but the difference in religious beliefs among the Hausa and Igbos caused both tribes to clash. Many Igbos left their homes to work and set up businesses around Nigeria especially the northern region, the largest region in Nigeria. This would set Nigeria to become a vast country of wealth through oil and the ingenious ideas of the Igbos. The Igbos began to thrive in different parts of the country. However, the Hausa were not too pleased by the dominant Igbos and the leaders of the Hausa land began to find themselves being employees of the Igbos in their own land. The spirit of envy spread throughout Nigeria and caused the deaths of many Igbos. The Prime Minister of Nigeria was Aousa 
and when called to address the tussle in the north, the people of Nigeria felt they were met with silence. With the way the electoral votes were arranged, the majority in northern region would always vote for a Hausa man, which led to an unbalanced leadership. The people also felt the leaders were engaging in corrupt practices and the flamboyant lifestyles didn't help satiate their hostility. The conspiracy of a coup began to brew. On the 15th of January 1966, a group of soldiers moved with Chukwuma Kaduna Ziogu and Emmanuel Ifeajuna on a supposed training session to the residence of the Premier of the North, Amadou Bello, to assassinate him and more, including the sitting Prime Minister, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa. The Federal Minister, Festus Okote Ebo, and Premier of the Western Region, Samuel Akintola. This wiped out the major senior politicians of the northern and western regions. The senior politicians that were spared were the President of the Nigerian Federation, Namdi Azikiwe, who was on a cruise in the Caribbean. Premier of the Eastern Region, Michael Okpara. And in the military, Igbo Army Chief, Johnson Aigiri Ironsi. Admit the chaos, Johnson Aigiri Ironsi took power and detained the military traitors. This immediately put Johnson Aguirre Ironsi as military head of state, ending the first Nigerian Republic. The one-sided murders of the senior politicians, mainly Aousa and Yorubaz, led many to believe that the whole plan was orchestrated to put the Igbos into power. Of course, this state of governmentship wasn't too pleasing to the northern and western regions. Aguirre Ronsi's failure to properly prosecute the traitors led to a counter coup executed that same year on the 29th of July 1966. Agri Ironsi spent time at the government house in Ibadan and when he was alerted to a possible military mutiny, he desperately tried to call Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan to inform him of the situation. However, the call was not picked up. That same morning, the government house was surrounded by troops headed by Major Motala Mohammed, Mohammed Buhari, Lieutenant Ibrahim Babaginda, and Sani Abasha, all future heads of state and president, to name a few. Johnson Aguirre Ronsi and his entourage are assassinated, and Yakubu Gowan is later placed as head of state after the turmoil. Motala Mohammed wanted to be the head of state, but as Yakubu Gowan was of a senior rank and the other military governor of the eastern region, Chuku Emeka Odumegu Ojuku. Also, the British and American advisors were against such a decision. So Motala Mohammed had to back down from the position. Talks about the maintenance of the military hierarchy were important. The man with the highest military position was Brigadier Babafemi Ogundipe. As Ojuku and Gowan both had the same military rank, to preserve the peace, Ojuku insisted that Ogundipe became the head of state. The northern region leaders did not agree, and because Ogundipe did not have the authority over his soldiers, as northerners refused to listen to a Christian southerner, he had to step out of the scuffle. This led Yakubu Gowan to become the new leader of the military-controlled Nigeria. 
With the North back in power, in September 1966, the anti-Ebo program commenced. Ebos in the northern region faced oppression. Ojuko did everything in his power to prevent any retaliation and promised the Ebos that they could return to the east safely. With the supposed backing from the political leaders of the North and West region. The mounting pressure from all sides led to a breakdown in the country's governing body and the disputes between Ojuku and Gowon began to bubble. To ease the country's disagreements, a meeting took place off soil in Aburi, Ghana in January 1967 which many called the Aburi Accord. The meeting which was meant to solve the issues within the military government through diplomacy instead worsened it. By the time both members got back to Nigeria, the agreement fell apart. This was due to Northern's entrance in the oil reserves in the East. To allow the East sovereign rule would, in their view, jeopardize Nigerians' main source of income. To weaken the East's grip on power, a summit took place in Benin where Gowan announced that four regional governors will be replaced. And the division of the three Nigerian regions into 12 states. Specifically, isolating the non Igbo River state and southeastern states that had the large oil reserves and access to the sea from the east central state. Gowon also annexed the city Portacot, which had its own oil reserves into the river's state. As a result, many Igbo traders had to flee to the homeland where they felt safe. This greatly weakened the Eastern Central. Talks of a secession began to brew. The agreement violation, an obvious power grab, led Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku to declare the Eastern regions independent from Nigeria and called the state Biafra. Your meeting today is very crucial. The East is at the crossroads. Since our last meeting, everything possible has been done by the enemies of the East to escalate the crisis in an attempt to bring about the collapse of this region. They have failed and will continue to fail. <laughs> In 1953, the late Sir Abubakar Tepab Lewa, in a speech in the Legislative Council, said, Since the amalgamation of the southern and northern provinces in 1914, Nigeria has existed as one country only on paper. It is still far from being united. The country is inhabited by peoples and tribes who speak different languages, who have different religions, different customs and traditions, and entirely different historical backgrounds in their way of life, and who have also attained different stages of development. We do not want our southern neighbors to interfere in our development, but I should like to make it clear to you that if the British quitted Nigeria now, at this stage, the northern people would continue their interrupted conquest to the sea. Interrupted conquest. That has always been the northern intention. Thank God that the East has now awakened to its responsibilities. And with that awakening, that ambitious dream will never be fulfilled in this country. Okay. <laughs>
on the 6th of July, 1967, Goan immediately declared war on Biafra, leading to what we now know as the Nigerian Civil War or the Biafra War. Many non Igbos did not want to live in an Igbo dominated land and instead joined forces with the Nigerian army. However, some non Igbos did join Biafra in the war, like Lieutenant Colonel Philip F. Young, who served as Biafra's Chief of Defense Staff. First President Nnamdi Azikiwe, one of the senior politicians who avoided the assassination, would be an advisor to Ojuku but would subsequently switch sides to support the war efforts of the Nigerian Federal Army. The Nigerian Army Forces 1st Division, mainly made up of Northerners, the Hausa and Fulanis. Soldiers launched an attack on Biafran forces, capturing Nsika and Gakem. The Biafran soldiers retaliated by taking control of the Midwest without much struggle due to an agreement made by both federal soldiers and the East to avoid further deaths of soldiers. Goan ordered a second division under the tutelage of Motala Mohammed to take over the Midwest. The Nigerian forces succeeded and also captured Benin City. However, Biafra succeeded in weakening the federal troops. The war then took another turn when Goan asked Colonel Benjamin Adekunle to form a 3rd Division, which he named 3rd Marine Commandos or Black Scorpion. This offensive division took over Biafra's south all the way to the Niger River. The Nigerian army forces began to expand with more Yoruba and Edo people joining the war. The Biafran forces were mainly headed by Igbos who saw this battle as a battle for their homeland. The Nigerian army led battalions to weaken Biafra's control over their territories. As a result, both forces lost many troops and had to go back and reorganize their plans. The Biafran forces were experiencing a blockade in the land, sea and air shipments, which slowly ate at their strength. The Nigerian army applied more pressure with a siege that blocked any resources coming in and out of the east. From July 26 to October 18th of 1967, a naval landing headed by Major Isaac Jasper Adaka Boru took control of the major Niger Delta cities and the port of Calabar with the assistance of 3rd Marine Commandos or Black Scorpion. During this time, on the 4th of October, Nigerian forces captured the capital of Biafra, Enugu, and pressured the Biafran forces in the north into the main Igbo territories. Biafran air forces were helped by Swedish aviator Count Carl Gustav von Rosen with his aircraft team of three Swedish people 
and two Biafrans. The team was named BAF, Biafran Air Force. They destroyed many aircrafts of the Nigerian Army Forces and dropped food during the widespread starvation of the Biafrans. During this time, Major Victor Banjo, Major Ife Ajuna, Philip Alele, and Sam Agbam were all executed by a firing squad on the orders of Ojuku due to treason. The execution aroused controversy because Ife Ajuna was reported to have spoken to the Nigerian army to bring forward a solution to end the war. They were put on trial and confirmed that the solution was to assassinate Ojuku so they could gain a prominent position after the war. The following year, in 1968, mountain talks of peace and amnesty arose among other African countries. Two conferences took place, one in the Republic of Niger under President Hamani Diori called the Niami Peace Conference and the OAU sponsored Addis Ababa Conference hosted by Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia to bring a peaceful conclusion to the war. However, both failed to bring both Gowan and Ojuku to a diplomatic agreement. Haile Selassie at the end of the conference was noted saying, I have for the past five weeks incessantly endeavored to help find a peaceful solution to this crisis afflicting our Nigerian brothers. The results achieved so far have fallen short of our expectations. The consultative committee cannot impose a settlement on the parties involved in the conflict. As a result, the war raged on. The blockades caused starvation among the Biafran troops. Visuals of the starving children inflicted by Kwashi Oka spread around the world media. The Red Cross came to help the injured and dying Biafrans, while many other medical groups came to help the Nigerian and Biafran forces. The Nigerian army forces had the full backing of the Western nations like Russia, America and Britain, while Biafra was mainly supported by France who was interested in the oil reserves in the East and some African countries like Zambia and Cote d'Ivoire. This Nigerian war seemed to have grown to a secret world war. Communist and socialist groups in Britain and America began protesting against the Nigerian armed forces. Despite the extremely dire circumstances, Biafra still did not concede. When, even when children, we, we, when parents will be running away, when children are crying over them, they will run, they will run away from their children. They, they don't even care to carry their children again. So many things will happen. But we pray that such a thing will not happen again in Nigeria. With supplies running out and in an extremely weakened state, the Nigerian army launched one final attack by the 4th Commando Division under the control of future Head of State and President Colonel Olusegun Obasanjo on the 23rd of December, which split Biafra. On the 7th of January 1970, Operation Tailwind commenced with the combined forces of the 3rd Commando Division 
and the first and second division. From the 9th to 11th of January 1970, the town of Oweri and Uli fell. The war finally came to a conclusion when the town of Amishi fell on the 13th of January 1970. To avoid assassination, Ojuku was advised to flee the country, leaving Philip F. Young, the chief of defense staff, to break the news of Biafra's surrender to the federal army. Ojuku fled to Cote d'Ivoire and was under protection by the sitting president at the time, Felix Ofuet Boini. After the war, a total of 100,000 soldiers were killed and 500,000 to 2 million civilians died. Altogether, around 3 million people perished during this war, making it one of the deadliest civil wars in history. Yakubu Gowon announced the term, no victor, no vanquished, which was meant to erase the ethnic tension. However, the Igbos were disposed of their properties and former political positions after the war. To this day, mostly Yoruba and Hausa Fulanis have the senior positions in the government. The civil unrest did not immediately cease as rumors of federal soldiers stealing from homes, raping women and stealing from loaded trucks spread throughout Nigeria. The Nigerian government introduced a new currency that overrode any of the currency used before the war, making the Biafran money useless. To avoid further concern, the Federal Army gave the Biafrans 20 pounds in exchange for their currency. This kept the Igbos behind the Hausa Fulani and Yorubas for many decades as they tried to rebuild themselves from scratch. The country was rebuilt as quick as possible from the oil revenue. But the political and social stances were not healed and in the present day the resentment is still felt among all tribes. The Hausa and Fulani were called zombies as they only knew how to move forward and take orders. This was the inspiration of Fela Kuti's song, Zombie. Although Yakubu Gowon was not Hausa or Fulani, in fact, he was Christian. But it is believed he was forced to join as they convinced him to fight for his language and not his Christian beliefs. Nigeria began to decline after the war and several coups took place in every decade after the war with many of the military soldiers involved in the 1966 July counter coup taking turns in leadership. The question now was what was next for Nigeria and how could this richly cultural and resourceful country prosper as one body? Well, we have ways we believe the country could advance. The signs of civil war were bubbling beneath the surface in Nigeria for decades before the first coup d'etat in January 1966. The racial, religious and social issues were held together by thin strings. Amado Bello was noticed saying this about the Igbos. One thing I've noticed, Premier, while I've been here, is that Northerners seem to have I might almost call it obsession about the Igbos. Could you perhaps explain that to me? Well, the Igbos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. 
if you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, within a year they will try to emerge as headman of that camp, and so on. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities, because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there weren't ten northerners in our civil service here. Then I tried to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. Is this policy of filling all key posts in the north solely with northerners and not with other Nigerians a temporary or permanent one? In actual fact, what it is, is a northerner first. If you can't get a northerner, then we take an expatriate like yourself on contract. If we can't, then we can employ another Nigerian, but on contract too. This is going to be permanent, I should say, for the, as far as I can foresee, because it will be rather dangerous to see the number of boys we are now turning from our, all our learning institutions coming out with having no, no work to do. I'm sure whichever government of the day might be, it will uh, feel rather embarrassed, and it might even lead to bloodshed. Doesn't this damage the idea, sir, of uh, all people in all regions in, in Nigeria being fellow citizens of one country? Well, it might, but uh, um, you are, I mean, new to our region, but how many northerners are employed in the east or in the west? The answer is no. And if there are, there may be ten laborers employed only in the two regions. The anger and envy directed at the industrious evils held the country back from true prosperity. As we said at the beginning of this documentary about the Biafran War, the evils living in the southern region were one of the main driving forces behind the country's wealth. Before independence, the evils were the most educated and the most open to Christianity. To this day, the most internationally renowned Africans in all fields are Igbos, Chino Achebe and Chimamanda in literature, to name a few. Ben Wonwu in sculpture and the arts, and the only African USA inventor of the year, Achilefu, inventor of the cancer goggles. The Northerners' rejection of the Igbo culture, which allows for social climb based on merit has slowed the country's upward mobility. The Jews who have a similar hard-working belief have prospered in any country that has promoted the notion of escaping poverty through work. One of the only African writing systems and civility came from the Igbos. To this day, the North is the most impoverished region in Nigeria and their rejection of Christianity has also led to the persecution of the Christian middle belt through terrorist groups like Boko Haram. The Igbos who at first fought against Christianity with the anglo arrow War, which commenced in 1901 and ended in 1902. They accepted the faith which opened them to missionary education. This gave the Igbos a tremendous advantage to scale in life and to become wealthy. In fact, the first Nigerian billionaire was Ojuku's father, Louise Philip Odumegu Ojuku, a titan in commerce. Ojuku himself stated after being pardoned by President Shehu Shagari in the 1980s that Igbos have been largely excluded from power. This could cause instability in the future. Now, we don't want to be one-sided and give off the feeling that we believe the Igbos are saints or that we are biased towards the Biafans. So we will outline the positive traits of the other main tribes. The Yorubas are highly educated and will be beneficial to the success of Nigeria. Men like Abiola was a successful Yoruba businessman and lawyer who, if chosen, could have possibly led Nigeria to great success. Dahausa, a master at farming and will prove important in Nigerian trade and commerce as shown by the businessman Alhassan Dantata. 
for one Nigeria to happen, all three tribes would have to work in a peaceful tandem. However, the engine that is Nigeria is not well oiled and as it stands, the corruption, thirst for power and domination will always keep Nigeria below the rest of the world.